Welcome to Words of Power with Joey DeMaio. I'm the founder and bassist of the band Man of War. I'm a record producer, an entrepreneur, and a public speaker. In this podcast, I discuss values and ideas that I believe help all of us to live a powerful life. And I speak with people that have a great message or that I find inspiring. This episode continues my conversation with my childhood friend and Man of War bandmate, Eric Adams. You heard the impact the Beatles had on his life and how committed he was to music from an early age. Our conversation picks up where Eric explains how his career choice affected lifelong friendships, and the mystery of how he became the greatest singer and frontman in the world is revealed. If you're enjoying my podcast, please make sure to rate it and leave a positive review on your favorite podcasting platform. And don't forget to subscribe so you'll get new episodes automatically. I, I remember saying, look, I want to do this for a living. I don't want to work a regular job anymore. I don't want to do this. I want to work with the music and just stay with the music, period. That's all I want to do. They couldn't make that decision. So I finally had to say to the drummer, I said, look, I'm going to move on. And I hate to say this, we've been together 15 years yeah. or so, but it's time for me to move on. And I don't know, if you want to come with me, come on. Then he was going to go with me, and I asked the bass player, who happened to be a cousin, of the guitar player right and i said to him i said paul this is this is really tough i hope you can understand i have to leave the band he was really pissed and he's still pissed today about it yeah i remember you told me this story before yeah yeah that must have been difficult because it was extremely difficult because just, all you were trying to do was explain how you felt about a career in music oh man and there's a big difference between a career in music or a career in anything if you wanted to be you know a chef what's the difference you wanted to take Take something to the next level of professionalism yeah. and it's a it's a life decision yeah. and clearly you either share that or you don't he didn't share it it was particularly hard for me because he was my best friend growing up i mean i'm talking five years old and so for him to just shun me away and say no nah, man how could you do this you know what an asshole how could you breaking us up and blah 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 you know that's the other thing about professionalism you have to be able to separate emotional attachments mm -hmm. from professional attachments and it it took me a long time to learn that. Mm -hmm. I'll never forget the phone call when we got dropped from EMI after three weeks, and everything was going so good on that Ted Nugent tour. We're getting added to the radio stations. We're doing fantastic. People are giving us standing ovations. They never heard of us or saw us, mm -hmm. you know, in these big arenas. And we're third on the bill, and we were kicking fucking ass. Mm -hmm. And the radio stations were digging battle him. And I got the phone call from the guy at the record company, and Bob, and he goes, oh, got bad news. We're going to have to let the band go. I'm like, what? Why? He goes, let the band go. Are you kidding me? The record's only been out three weeks. And he goes, yeah, well, uh, you know, we got to drop bands because of money. And you know, a couple big artists left the label. And I'm like, well, that's fucked up. That's fucking crazy. We're getting fucked. He goes, Joey, it's not personal. It's just business. I go, what the fuck are you talking about? It's the same for me. I understand the difference now because I find myself saying the same thing to people. Mm -hmm. Hey, look, it's not personal. It's business. There are times when the personal side of a relationship is fantastic. But if the business part isn't working out, let's keep what's good. Let's not ruin the other. I know how he felt when you said you were leaving because you were leaving to do something that required even more work than you had put in. Yeah. And he yeah. was happy just being what I call a weekend warrior because they were having fun. Yeah, and it was fun. We had a good time, you know, while it lasted, and there you have it. But the older you get, if you stay in that groove, just because it's fun, all of a sudden, your chances diminish over the years. Yeah. But you always worked. You always broke your ass, and fortunately, you acquired a skill at an early age, right? Mm -hmm. You were actually a real professional butcher. Yeah, I was a meat cutter, yeah. I did that for a long time, too. <laughs> Now let's talk about that job. Was, okay. that, a, was that a lot of fun? Uh, take well, us through a day, particularly when that meat truck came in. Well, it's a double-edged sword because was it fun lifting up 250 pounds every time and carry it off the truck and hook it in the store on a hook? You it's know. good for your back, isn't it? <laughs> So that wasn't fun, but on the other hand, it was a hell of a workout. And doing that every right. week, week in and week out, it got to be, okay, here's 250 pounds, give it to me, let's go. So in that sense, that helped me out. That's what our families taught us to do. You work. You, you do work. any damn thing you want to do, but you worked. For you started when you were like 14 or 15, not only working with the band, right? No. Yeah. My first job, I was a paper boy for an evening paper. How old? Oh, my God. 
I was probably about 12 years old or so. Mm -hmm. My parents didn't drive me around. It was carry the papers through the snow, through the rain, through anything that came. Let's talk about that for just a sec. The big paper sack is what we used to carry over our bed. Remember the big canvas bag? I can only equate it to the pictures I've seen on Christmas cards of Santa (laughs) with that big sack dragging behind him. Remember what that was like carrying those newspapers? Oh, yeah. And I'd have to do that every night. I still wasn't making enough money to get by because at this point at 12 years old I was self-sufficient I was buying my own clothes I was helping with the family bills you know I was doing everything to help out and so I got a morning paper route as well and I would get up at four o'clock in the morning and I deliver the post standard every day and then I go to school and then I come home and I practice and then I grab this citizen at night and I do the night route every night and I'm gonna tell you what that's ball busting work and I talked about that we came from families that came from another country and came to America and immigrated and it wasn't usual for people like us to go to college. It was almost not even a choice, to tell you the truth, when you heard the stories of how your parents' parents suffered and their parents suffered and how Mm -hmm. they were suffering. And you watched our parents break their ass Mm -hmm. doing work that they couldn't stand, but they did it to keep the family together and feed everybody, to just go earn a little bit of money, even on your own, Mm -hmm. to take some of the pressure off your parents, Mm -hmm. which in your case, having, you know, huge family, that must have been a very satisfied feeling to get out there and do something really, really great. That's a huge accomplishment. I felt good about it because, especially at Christmas time, Christmas is right around the corner when we're recording it. Right around this time when I was very early teens, I mean, I felt like, okay, I've got young, young sisters that, uh, you know, were waiting for Santa to bring them things. And my father was working a job at the time. My mother was at work, and very rarely did mothers work back Mm -hmm. then. So I helped out with the Christmas things. And that's just, like you say, it was the way we were brought up. Whatever had to be done had to be done, no questions asked. Get out there and work and help out with the family. And that's just the way it was. How did you start learning how to be an actual meat cutter? Uh, When I was 16, my brother said they needed a cleanup kid at the meat market. And so I went there and I talked to um, Jim Hogan, who is a second father to me. Yes, the guy was a saint, God rest his soul, no doubt. Nice guy. What What a a nice guy. Yes, he was. I went there and asked Jim, I says, uh, you know, know, I told him who I was, and I said, I'm wondering if you have any work here for me. And he said, as it happens, we need a kid to clean up the store, and uh, we'll show you how to do it. He said, let me see you mop the floor first. (laughs) I said, oh, man, I didn't want to do it. There were customers in the store and everything. And I says, okay, I got the mop out, and I slopped it around, and I mopped it up and rang it out, all muddy, shitty water all over my hands. And he saw that, and he said, okay, come in Monday. And we're going to start you. We're going to teach you how to tear these machines apart, teach you how to clean up this meat market. And every night I would go there and uh, clean the machines. Friday night was the late night for the meat cutters because Saturday morning was extremely busy. You couldn't take the time to cut meat on Saturday morning because there were just so many customers. Well, when did the when did these trucks come in with all the trucks? Trucks came in on Monday. And that was yeah. supposed to hold you till the next Monday. And then right? held you till okay. Monday. Okay. See, back then you had to break the cattle down. It wasn't like today they come in boxes. Right. Everything's it's already, already cut. cut. There's no there's really there's hardly any work for true meat cutters no. in this day and age, right? No, not anymore. You know, back then you had to take the cattle, you had to cut it up and know where the cuts were and how to get the angles on the meat to make it tender. So you did a journeyman's apprentice. Yeah. I'll tell you what happened. One day they asked me to come in on Saturday. Then I came in and it was busier than hell. I didn't know what I was doing. So I just asked somebody what can I get for him? And I had one person tell me he needed tenderloin. And I said, Okay. Don't we all? And I turned around, and I asked the meat cutter, who was the head cutter at the time, and I said, this gentleman here needs some tenderloin steak. For the people that don't know. That's the top shelf. Tip of the top. That is very expensive. You don't want to screw things up there. You mean you don't want to cut it wrong? You don't want to cut it wrong. Or give the guy two pounds by mistake. My God. If he so, ordered a, <laughs> I, I get it. So I, I remember the meat cutter looked at me. He says, we're all busy here. I says, I know we're really busy. I said, but it's tenderloin. I said, I don't know. He said, do you want to be a meat cutter? Then cut meat. I remember him saying that like it was just That's the way things were back then. Then go cut meat. Yep. I said, okay. Took the sinew off it and started cutting it. And that was it. And that's how I started. Wow. You want to swim? Jump in the pool. Pretty amazing. It's interesting because you always were able to work that job yep. and play gigs. Yeah. All <laughs> over and i mean all over and to show what a good guy your boss was you said friday night was a 
big night. Yeah. But he was good enough to let you out of there. Sometimes you had to skip a Friday, yeah. right? Because oh, yeah. he let you go because you had to travel. You couldn't have made the gig. And the rest of the guys, the other cutters that were there all day long, they all cleaned up. Yeah. None of them seemed to mind because they knew that I was doing something I really loved to do. You were trying to better yourself. I'm going to bring up something that you're going to remember. I know you will. Back when you and I were playing together, mm -hmm. one of the first bands we played in. Yep. I was a meat cutter at the time. We were playing on a Friday night and I had to get the time off and it was busy and I worked part of the night and I had to leave and uh, you guys loaded the truck and you guys went to the gig and set everything up and I was going to meet you at the show so I went to the show and I looked and I said where's my Marshall stack <laughs> oh yes where's my Marshall stack <laughs> I recall and Joey said oh shit we left it home oh god we forgot it I said where's my guitars he said well, oh, shit, we left that home, too. Well, here we go. Tell showtime. Here's your microphone. I never <laughs> forgot that. People, that was the first day I was forced to sing behind a microphone wire, okay? <laughs> and I, I wish there was some film of that because I must have looked like a jackass up on that stage bouncing. No, you grabbed the tambourine. I recall it. Oh, yeah, I did the tambourine thing. Yeah, that's but you, right. But you know what's really hilarious about it? And you talk about fate. I can remember like it was yesterday. All the gigs that we would play, and now we're skipping ahead actually a little bit, because a lot of people don't know that. We had some pretty sophisticated setups for those days. We had a truck, I think it was about a 16 foot, mm -hmm. and it had an electric lift gate. On oh, yeah, back, yeah right? I remember that. Yeah. So that was good. We could load our gear off the truck, and it would go down on ground level, and we'd load it in. The only problem was we had to load all the gear right, in the truck, which that's was so. back then bands of our day carried their own PA system, the whole thing, yeah. cabinets, power amplifiers fires, horns, mixing boards, and yep. then a lighting show. Yep. Right? And then we used to carry the organist's B3 organ, a full <laughs> B3 and an electric piano, right? And Leslie cabinets. For those who don't know what Leslie cabinets are, they are these big wooden things that are the size of a six-drawer bedroom set. We had so much stuff. That 16-foot truck was full, right? And we would pack it. So I would drive in the truck. Sometimes I'd drive or I'd ride in the truck, but I'd usually ride in the truck. You always drove your own car because mm -hmm. you were coming from work and you had to get back home. Mm -hmm. So I can remember talking to the other guys in the band. While we're driving to the truck, I'm like, you know, music's changing right now. We got Deep Purple, you know, and they got Ian Gillen, and Eric loves Ian Gillen. He loves to sing like that. And, you know, he's got the guitar in his way, and Ian Gillen doesn't have a guitar. And then Uriah Heep, I mean, look at that guy. He's good looking like Eric, and he's up front, and he's dressed cool, and he's singing. He's not wearing a guitar, and this is where it's going with these fucking bands. And they're like, yeah, but, you know, he was going to tell him not to play guitar. He loves playing guitar. I go, he likes it. He doesn't love it. <laughs> and, and I'm trying to convince these guys that that somebody has got to say, Eric, you got a God-given voice. You're a good guitar player. You could play drums. You could play bass. You could play anything. We know that. But you are a front man. He says, hey, these guys are like, I'm going to fucking tell them. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, what about you, John? You've been in a band with this guy for fucking forever. Why don't you tell me? He goes, I'm going to fucking say nothing. It'll go fucking crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I said, all right. So I left at that. But we went to that gig. I said to these guys, leave his marshal in the truck. And they're like, are you kidding? I said, no, fuck it. Leave it in there. And they said, all right, well, we'll bring his guitar in anyway. I said, what the fuck for? You're going to bring his guitar and he's going to want to play it. Maybe he'll want to plug into somebody else's amp. And I said, no. From this day forward, he <laughs> is a front man. Oh, okay. The style of his hero, Ian Gillen. Right. And, and I said, and I know that's going to come off really good. And I'll never forget when you came in you said like Where, where's my amp <laughs> <laughs> and of course these other fuckers you know tough guys they were looking at their shoes very intensely <laughs> and whether you people know it or not eric as you hear him laugh he's got this wonderful magical laugh right and he's got a great <laughs> sense of humor but on occasion over the years he's been known to yell a no. little bit <laughs> yeah it's no like, it's a rumor so I'm about to yell now because it's the first time I heard this story. It was in the car. It was in the truck the whole time. It was. God damn it. Goodbye. I'll see you later. I, and so he goes, where's my hand? It's in the truck. And he goes, he goes shit. how are we going to play the show? I said, I think we'll get by. He goes, well, where's my guitar? What about the double lead and highway star? Uh, I said, I think we'll be fine. Without it. He goes, what the fuck am I supposed to do? I said, you're supposed to do what God wants you to do. Use that voice and sing. He goes, yeah, but what the fuck am I supposed to do when I'm not singing? God wants me to punch you right now. <laughs>
And so, and so he fucking did it. He grabbed a tambourine because he needed something in his hand and something to do. And that's the story of how he became the world's greatest singer and front man. From that day forward, we never looked back because it was he was fucking great. I mean, you see what he is today. It's fucking great. Oh, that's some classic shit. <laughs> <laughs> At a certain point, you had played with a bunch of different musicians locally right. and stuff, but none of those guys were really super serious right Right after that band broke up. Right. We played in the band. It was really a pretty good band, actually, as I recall, but we were going to do one show, and, and I got a phone call saying that the guitar player got in an accident. He's in the hospital. I said, what do you mean he's in the hospital? How bad is it? Is he getting checked out? Is he still going to be able to play? Because at the time, I was the leader of the band. I signed the contracts. And I said, you know, it's my ass on the line. We're supposed to play tonight. And uh, I called the hospital. And the nurse said, well, are you family? And I said, well, no, I'm not family. But I explained to her that I had responsibility. And I, I just needed to know if we're going to be able to do the show tonight. And she told me, she says, well... He, he won't be doing the show tonight. So I called up the place and canceled that performance. Then I went up to the hospital to see him. That's when I found out he was in a motorcycle accident and was dead. Oh, so yeah, I, said, I remember. Oh, he, was, he was another fantastic guy. He was a great guy. That was a rough time. And that was the last band I was in when you called me. At so, that time, we played a tribute to him a year after that. And all the money that we made went to his family you know, for his memory. And while we were rehearsing, some asshole broke into the theater that our gear was in no, I remember and that. stole all yep. our equipment and we had to borrow gear just to do the show and we still had to make payments on that PA system oh, that yeah. was stolen and I said to my wife I said that's it <laughs> I just can't do this anymore I'm done I'm finished and then you came to my door yeah and I remember because after all those years of playing in clubs before all that stuff happened it was kind of a turning point I think for all of us that playing in a band that played played Deep Purple and all the popular music, right? Mm -hmm. It was a realization that something had to give. We can't carry on like this. Not to mention getting treated like shit, let's face it. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you remember, you know, when I asked that one club owner, we were doing a, a, a summer gig at that place, right? The hotel. Place was packed. Yeah. And I'm standing there wearing a silver sparkle jacket and platform shoes, yeah. you know, that was the style of the day. And, and I asked the owner of the place, this old miserable bastard smoking a cigar, I said, excuse me, sir, are the Coca-Colas or the Pepsis free for the band? And the guy goes, what the fuck are you talking about, kid? You think you're in Chicago? Get your fucking ass on that stage. And he kicked me in the ass. <laughs> In front of everybody. I didn't forget that. that he was kicked so... me in the ass in front of everybody in the club. All the girls who I wanted to be so cool for, all the guys. And I said, in that moment, my day will come where I will play in a band and no club owner will say anything to me but thank you sir and if they say anything different we'll pack up and fucking leave and you stuck to your guns yes, i remember our first tour was man of war we started in florida we called the sound check tour yeah we do a sound check the owner would scream at us saying to turn down yep joey said we're leaving <laughs> That's it. Every show was the same. And I think another defining moment was, I'm sure you remember playing in the Holiday Inn circuit. Yep. You know, I want to preface this. The Holiday Inn circuit, playing nightclubs, teaching guitar lessons, singing lessons, whatever a musician has to do, we have to live, okay? And I admire anybody who tries to live from their music. I don't care what they do. They have my respect. And it's not easy, believe me, to put food on the table as a musician in today's day and age, probably even worse than when we started. But I can remember playing in the Holiday Inn Band, and I think that was the final moment for me when I said to myself, now we really have hit the fucking toilet. I mean, can you remember? Everywhere we went, there was always a fucking asshole manager playing too loud. Oh, everywhere. <laughs> everywhere. And at that time, people, let me let me stress one thing here. When he's talking about the Holiday Inn circuit, that was when I wanted to do music for a living, period. That was it. That was the only way we could do it. There was no record deal. There was no Man of War at the time. There was nothing. There was just a band who was looking to play music, and that's all, to make a living. And so we got into this Holiday Inn circuit, and everywhere we played, they would always say, 
turned down. You're way too loud. Turned down. It was my ass on the line because I signed the contracts. I looked at him. I said, "Would you, Joe? Yeah, yeah. I tell you, fuck. What the fuck? You gotta turn down. You gotta turn down." He said, "Yeah, I will. Yeah, oh, yeah I understand. I, yeah, I understand. Yeah." His fingers just touched the volume knob. I don't know what he did. Kind of like petting a dog. <laughs> I think he turned it up. I, I don't know. We played the next song in the club. Where, uh, look, you're driving people out of my place. You got to turn down. You got to turn down. Okay. Okay. Joey, we got to turn down. Uh, oh, Jesus Christ. I'm sorry. I think he turned it up again. You guys are fired. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> Every show. Yep. And, Every show. And this is another lesson that we learned. You're right. Because they bitched. It was too loud for them. But you know what? A fart would have been too loud for these fucking people. <laughs> Let's be honest. Because they were themselves farts. The way they treated us. Okay? When that bastard, one of the bastards, the last bastard to fire us. Okay? I remember he said, I'm calling the musicians union. Yeah, I remember. Now, stupid me. I thought, ha ha, this asshole's going to see. What's that guy from the musicians union who, by the way, way we were paying our dues yeah they used to get a piece of every gig didn't yep. they yeah they did okay yep. so i'm thinking to myself <laughs> i'm so happy he's gonna call that guy this fucker's gonna wake up he'll see who's who <laughs> this guy's gonna straighten his ass out so the guy comes in and he goes yeah what's going on i want to talk to the band and hear their story and i'm thinking uh-huh so he listens like jesus christ goes, boys i'll tell you i'm on your side i said well thank you now straighten this guy out we want to get paid we're going to get the fuck out of here we're never going to come back here and i want to turn this guy in and you can tell everybody at the union don't send any more bands to this bum right so all right boys sit here i'll take care of it he goes over and talks to the guys like jesus christ i don't know what to happen here but look we want to keep you happy here we don't want bands in here that are the wrong types of bands. So you know what I mean? Yeah. All he did was hustle us out the fucking door. That's right. And that was the end of paying dues. In that moment, I had the vision for all men play on 10. I'm never going to turn down again. Okay. That was the final moment. I couldn't take it anymore. Now, you listeners, you've got to understand what happened here. One, we played one show. This was towards the very end of all this turning down crap that was going on. I know where you're going. Go ahead. And the guy kept saying, no, there's two different ones, oh, but okay. this is the one. All right, please tell. Guy you're doing kept very saying, good, by the way. <laughs> guy kept saying, turn down. People are leaving. And our guitar player would hit this one note and smile at this one guy in the front row. And the guy lost his toupee. I mean, his toupee flew off the head. He hit this note, and then the guy screamed at him. And he screamed, the guitar player screamed back, like, Aah! You got to understand, there was nobody in the place anymore. Nobody except the bartender. That was it. So we took a break, and I went to the owner of the place, and I said, you know, obviously, we're not the band for this place, so there's nobody here what do you say we just pack it up and go home a little early the guy said fuck you i hired you to play you're gonna play right i said two in the morning i, I said okay fine no problem we'll finish our set went back out there we did the set and towards the end of the set i started tearing down the drum kit <laughs> While we were playing, I take the cymbal, I sing some songs, put the cymbal down the side, I take the other cymbal apart, got the drums. By the time we finished, <laughs> we were packing, we each took turns putting shit in the truck, like, okay, bass solo. <laughs> and by the time we finished on stage, all we had was, I think, a guitar, and people were plugged into one amp. No, a drum solo was last. We the took drum solo was the out. last he thing. He was just on we stage no, with the snare drum. He had just a snare drum on stage. That was it. We were laughing as we were packing the shit up, but we played, and he was so pissed off at us. Oh my God, he was pissed off, and I didn't give a good rat's ass. I didn't care. And this other time we played, you'll remember, Joe. He was up north someplace. Yes, it was by the border of Canada. The guy had a Scottish I, accent. The summer encampment is what it was at okay. the end of the season, and there was nobody there either. There was nobody there either. Right. That's right. We played this one show. Guy was a nice guy. Yes, he was. At first. Yes, he was. He was a very nice guy at first. And he says, you know, the drinks are on us. The drinks are on us, boys. What do you drink? We said, Coors Light. He says, I got plenty of Coors Light. I've got it up here. Don't worry. You can drink all you want, boys. All you want. You're drinking on me, laddies. <laughs> We're like, Jesus, he's the greatest fucking guy in the world. We couldn't believe it. 
<laughs> so tell them what happened then. <laughs> you know, again, poor Eric was, was the leader of that band and signed all the contracts. And this place was a beautiful place on the lake. And they had these summer cabins, but they were shitholes. They had no screens on the window. And this was the end of the season. And all the bees and flies and bugs are freezing. Where do they want to go? Inside where the light is. No screens. Holes in the walls. And it, you know, So these cabins were where they put us up. And that was a big thing for the booking agents in the days of the holiday. And boys, you're all set. They've got accommodations. <laughs> Beware of that word, musicians. Accommodations, okay? Always ask what their definition of an accommodation is. Because it could be anything from a fucking cot to a cum-stained couch in the back of the fucking dressing room, what they call the dressing room, which is a closet or a floor, a sleeping bag. Okay, never trust the word accommodations. Anyway, so they put us up in these cabins. And the guy was, you know, a nice guy in the beginning. I said, well, you got cores? Yeah, no, we got cores. We got a lot of it. I said, okay, good. Well, let's have a few cases then. <laughs> that, uh -uh. that was the first tipping point. Let's have a few cases, right? So a few cases went the first night. And we played, and there was nobody there. You know, there was just like the bartender and a couple of local people people that lived up there but it, like I said it was a tourist joint anyway we ended up playing and we got frustrated we kept drinking and drinking until finally you know we went in I think it was like the last night and uh, we said yeah can we have some more cores he goes we've got none left and he was not too happy right so I said boy this guy he went from sweet to sour pretty fast he could have given us a different beer <laughs> we would have taken that but he wasn't offering anything so we just said well let's try and get out of here early okay so let's just give them everything we got here and play as loud as we fucking can. Play everything so he drives us the fuck out of here and we'll be happy to go. Let's see how soon he can fire us. Because it was a long drive. We played instrumentals. We played everything loud. It wasn't working until finally we decided to do what's known as the harmonic war. On guitars or basses, there are specific ways to play notes that go into what's known as a harmonic. And they are sometimes octaves and other octaves, above octaves. And when they are played extremely softly, they're very beautiful. But when they are played against another one that is not anywhere near the key at war volume, it can really make you crazy. And so we started doing these insane harmonics as loud as we could play. And the guy's dogs started howling and howling while we're playing. He had German shepherds. And the people that were there, two or three people, they left. They ran for the hills. And the guy came up to the stage screaming. He goes, I can't figure it out for the life of me. You don't have half the equipment the other groups have, but I can see you're running it to the hilt. You're killing my dogs. <laughs> Get the hell out of here. <laughs> Which, that's what we wanted. And that was the end of our holiday and career. Oh, my God. <laughs> Needless to say, he didn't give us any cores for the road. <laughs> <laughs> so that was that. And of course, that got back uh, to the booking agent yeah. for the Holiday Inn. And he, funnily enough, became disinterested in the band. <laughs> so that was that. You ended up stopping playing for a while. Yeah. Right? You, were, yep. you were disgusted with the whole scene. I can't imagine why. I was done. So then you came. Joey came to my house and said, uh, I got this guy in New York. Plays guitar. Name is Ross. Pretty good. You know, we get along great. I met him on tour when I was with Black Sabbath. He says, and, uh, you know, we used to play in the dressing room, and it sounded pretty damn good. We want to get a band together. And I said, I got the singer. He said, I'm talking about you. I said, I don't want to know nothing about it. Uh, that's not for me. He said, what? He said, come on. I said, Joe, it's not for me. Don't want it. He said, are you sure? I said, I'm so sure. I, I'm not doing this anymore. I am done with this music business. I'm finished. He said, Jesus Christ. He said, think about it. I said, I don't need to think about it. I'm done. He said, will you at least sing on a demo? I got some songs together. and Would you at least sing that? I said, well, fine. I said, I'll sing the demo as a favor to you because we've known each other since we were kids. So we rehearsed um, in some shithole in our hometown of somebody's living room. That was the first time I met Ross. We didn't have a drummer, but we rehearsed and got uh, like three or four songs together. Some of the songs from Battle Hymns. It was Battle Hymn, Shell Shock. Yeah, we did that. So then we went to another city and we recorded these songs. I hired a drummer and uh, we recorded the songs. I said, okay, there you go. And I went back home. A week later... <laughs> There's a knock on my door. I open it's Joey standing there. He says, we got a record deal. I said, who? 
He said, we, we got a record deal. I said, we don't even have a band. He said, we got a record deal. He said, with Capitol Records. I said, bullshit. He said, we have a record deal. Do you want to do it? I said, absolutely not. I don't want to do it. Good luck. Have a great time. I'm done. He said, oh, Jesus Christ. He said, this is what you want to do your whole life. Every musician wants to make a record. You know, the record is the hilt. You want to make an album? Come on. I says, not me. I'm done with this business. You understand? I'm done. He said, look, sleep on it, think about it, I'll come back tomorrow, I'll, you know, let's decide tomorrow. I said, okay. So that night, my wife and I talked about it, and she said, well, you've certainly got the voice for it. And she said, if you don't do it, you're going to be saying to yourself, what if, your whole life. If you do do it and it falls flat, you can say to yourself, well, you gave it a shot. I said, yeah, you're right. So Joey came knocking on the door again. I said, let's get this fucking thing done. Then we started rehearsing again and rehearsing, rehearsing. And that's how Man of War started, actually. We went down to Florida, hired another drummer down there to play the drums. And uh, that's how Man of War was born, right there. Yeah, and it's natural to get discouraged. There's always one guy, or maybe two at the most in a band, who have the burning fire to want to do it and put up with shit like we did. And right. hey, sometimes we still do, but not for long. You know? <laughs> right, right. But the point is, you have this wish to show people how much you love music. You're getting pushed down and pushed down. And so sometimes people that are supposed to give up, they give up because it's easier, certainly, mm -hmm. to do it. But some of us have to do it. It's like a fish. They have to swim. You put them on the, on the land, they die. Right. That's the way it is. Right. If you could go back in time and give your 16-year-old self advice based on your experiences, what would you say that advice would be? Be a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> that's no, what kidding. you heard. That's I'm the kidding. advice you got, I'm sure, on more than one occasion. I don't know. I guess the advice I could give, I'm living proof. Well, we're both. We're living proof that if you keep doing what you love to do, you're happy doing it. No matter what the consequences are, you're happy doing it on stage. And, you know, some shows you get fired, some shows you don't. If you're doing something every day that you can't stand, it's hard work. But someone told me, I think my dad told me a long time ago, if you work a job that you love, you'll never work work a day in your life. And that's true. That one day we did that five hour plus show. In Bulgaria. Yeah. That, I mean, I could have done seven hours. I could have done 10 hours. We all could have. Yeah. Fantastic. I guess my advice is if you love it, stick to it and it'll happen. All right, well, uh, what can I say? I hope you guys have enjoyed what you've heard tonight. Thank you so much for coming on. Your talent is peerless. Thank you for the Amen. years, thanks. and thanks for being on the show. It's been thanks. so much fun. We should do this again. That was fun. Yeah, I'm sure the reviews <laughs> that come in will demand it, okay? <laughs> Great. Thanks. This was Words of Power with Joey DeMaio. If you enjoyed this podcast, please leave a rating and review on your favorite podcasting platform. And make sure to subscribe to receive new episodes automatically. Visit me on social media. Let me know what you think and what you'd like to hear about and get constant updates. My username on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter is Real Joey DeMaio. And if you know someone who could use inspiration and encouragement or who would enjoy hearing about the life of a musician and entrepreneur, tell them about this show. The more we spread the word, the more people we can help to live a powerful life. You can also paste a link to this podcast in a group email or group message to your friends. Thank you again for joining me. Have a great day. And remember, live a powerful life. life.